Welcome to the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show, a broadcast service of globalbusinessnews.net. Now, here's your host, Ed Cohen. This is Ed Cohen in San Diego, and you're on Global TV Talk Show, unit of globalbusinessnews.net. Our special guest today is Stephen Howard, Caliente Leadership, author of 21 business books on leadership. And his special guest at mine is Bill Welter. Stephen, take it away. Thank you, Ed. Well, this is our Strive XL show. This is where we like to talk to leaders about how other leaders can become better leaders, uh, improve team leadership, and just help everyone improve but basically um you know strive to improve but the xl for bill's sake is the uh, the xl in our show title means living extra large so we want to uh, we we originally wanted to call this strive x after tedx and and spacex and you know copy everyone else but but there was already a, a strive x somewhere in a thrive x so we we called it xl so we want everyone to live extra large we want leaders to live extra large in the future and so bill give us a little bit of of uh, your background and then if you could uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your philosophy which i read about one time which is about learn from the past and and uh can't remember live in the future so tell, tell, educate me on what your philosophy is here okay so um <clears throat> So I'll, go, I'll give you the, the quick tagline on that, and then I'll give you my background. So the tagline is learn from the past, deal with today, and prepare for the future. Um, and that has come through, oh my gosh, um, let's see, over the past 50 plus years, I've had four careers. So I've spent, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll round things around. So I spent five years in the Marine Corps, um, and in the Marine Corps, I was both an enlisted and an officer. So I saw both sides of the coin. Uh, I spent um, five years doing honest to God factory engineering. So I've been inside factories and got fingernails dirty. Uh, I spent uh, 30 years doing consulting um, on two sides of the fence. One of them was on the side of the fence of business consulting, with various forms of Ernst, whether it's Ernst and Ernst, Ernst and Winnie. Left them for 10 years, came back when they were <laughs> young. Uh, and then I also worked for a, um, um, an application engineering consulting firm. And then for the past, I don't know, 10 years or so, I've been writing and teaching and having fun. So uh, I just, I build myself as an official old guy uh, and, I, and I have no idea when I'm gonna stop working because why, we don't need to. So that, that's it, that's my quick summary. So being a Marine, uh, the idea of preparation is number one, right? Oh, well, absolutely. And, and the, the challenge there is really kind of, um, uh, not only being ready to react, but kind of kind of think about what could be happening. Um, and so one of the quick stories on this one is uh, before, so I'm a uh, Vietnam veteran. And because before I was going to Vietnam, I read up on, at that time, which, what had been French Indochina and the, and the French when they were there. And the big failure of the French was something called the, the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, where they were in this village and there was a sheer cliff behind them. And they thought nobody could get up on that cliff. Well, the Viet Minh disassembled artillery pieces, carried them up on their back and rained hell on them and <laughs> drove them out of the city. And so that was one of those things of thinking about, um, when you think about the future, you gotta pay attention to the assumptions that you're making. Cause if they're good, they're good. But if they're bad, you're in big trouble. So not to get into politics, it's not political, it's just business, but um, why did the French let that area develop into such a, a fire pit? <laughs> well, uh, and, and that would get political and that is a piece of history, but I, we'll just say the whole colonial era um, was, uh, people did not necessarily want to be colonialized and I'll just leave it at that. Well, having lived in Asia for 21 years, that applied not just to Vietnam, but all across all across uh, Southeast Asia. Yeah, absolutely. But by one one leader or another. Yeah, or one yeah. country or another. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, definitely. Yeah. So in order to prep in today's world, which is uh, COVID related and impacted everything, business goes on. But the way it's done, particularly with people 
communications, right? Bill, isn't that the, the biggest thing right now? Well, um, yes and. Uh, and so it's the communications piece, but part of the challenge there is, and, and here's my personal soapbox, we have spent, oh my gosh, 20 years on a cr crusade to become more and more efficient. And so corporations have been living by the mantra of become lean and mean, do more with less and all the rest of that. The problem that you run into is when you get a, a shock to a system like COVID, people have not been looking up and saying what could happen because they're so hunkered down dealing with today um, that they haven't been spending time looking out into the future. Uh, so I'm actually looking at, and part of that is communicating what you're seeing. So I'm working on a program that I'm going to launch next year, um, just basically called Don't Be Taken by Surprise. Mm. And my, my, uh, my, cur my current poster child for that is every government in the world who was taken by surprise by COVID. And when you look at this, you'd say, well, gee, it came out of the blue. But if you look over the past 10 years, Every, we've had 10 pandemics, epidemics, yeah, epidemics, excuse me, I keep screwing the two words up, um, around the world. So we've had SARS, and we've had MERS, and we've had Zika virus, and we've had Ebola, and, we've, and governments around the world have said, oh, it can't happen here, you know, it's over there. I'm sorry, a virus gets on an airplane and it travels as fast as the airplane does. Um, but yet part of it is communicating and taking the time to look for clues. And because we were so focused on being efficient, I, you know, I, I got so many people that I've talked to, they just simply say, I don't have time. I'm just trying to get my job done. So yeah, it's, it, it's our fault collectively. So, so Stephen, isn't that a part of what used to be called strategic planning? Uh, yeah, and it had various names to it, um, but yeah, and uh, sort of situational planning and various things. I, I, I think Bill's hit the nail on the head. Uh, you know, certainly the last 10 years or so, people have been so focused on quarterly results. They're, they're, as he said, they're head down. That's a great, a great visual. I, I keep saying as he said that, that people head down and instead of looking out, uh, I think is, is so, so important. To, but, to, go ahead, Bill. Well, to, to the head down metaphor or it, visual, um, I've been using with, it, with my clients, uh, the, the metaphor is of a radar screen. And I put three zones in the radar screen. In the center of the radar screen is the reaction zone. You got nothing, you can't do anything except to react to the stuff that's falling on you. Mm -hmm. uh, a little further out is the adaptation zone where you can say, well, let's look for the clues as to what's going on, what trends are going on out there. And then the farthest reaches of this thing is the anticipation zone. And when you, you've got to be anticipating by looking at clues and putting them together, you know, connect the dots, so to speak. What was the so first one? The, the inside of the radar screen is the reaction zone. Reaction. Reaction. You're just and, reacting to what's happening all around you. Yeah, and, and you've got no time. I mean, it's like, oh my gosh, we're in trouble and, and you're in problem solving mode at that point, as opposed to trying to intercept the future. Yeah, and, and what's happening, I would guess now, is so many people are just at the most into the second zone. They, they, they're no one's even thinking 10 years out right now. Or if think people, people I talk to are talking, you know, six months to two years out. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but then, so I, I listened to, um, to a fascinating uh, um, um, live stream this morning, just a few, a couple hours ago from The Economist uh, magazine, and they were looking at what's going on in 2022 and major themes for the, for the 2022 right. timeframe. And the, the editor of The Economist, one of his things was talking about the, the autocracy versus democracy. And that got him into a conversation regarding um, China. And the fascinating thing about China is that right now they are slamming the brakes on anything that has to do with games and stuff like that. And they're trying to turn around and saying, what's the future? And the future is artificial intelligence um, and some of the pharma stuff that's going on. And you know they've got the adva advantage, I guess I could call it that, of being able to say, you know, do this. Because 
we're just going to fight about it. Um, they're just going to get some stuff done. And it's kind of fascinating. Now, if you, do you don't mind, I'm going to keep talking because you got me on a roll now. No, keep, <laughs> keep rolling. Man. This is good. So, I'm, I'm taking, so, you know, I'm old, old school and taking notes. So. Oh, good. <laughs> well, so here, here's a fascinating one because now we're worrying about the future. But if I go back to 1990, um, Lester Thoreau, who was an economist and then also ended up as the dean of uh, MIT's business school, I one wrote a book called Head to Head. And his issue on Head to Head was, and this is when we were getting our butt kicked by Japan. Um, and the subtitle was Head to Head, the coming economic battle between America, West Germany, and Japan. Well, West Germany has now become Germany. Um, and Japan is kind of not unimportant. But one of his issues was um, we were going to lose the battle because of our education system. And he was looking into the future and basically said, you know what, we, have, we just don't have enough people who are smart business people and smart engineers. And, you know, 20 some years, 25 years later, we fall into the, the reality of STEM. Um, and, um, and his stuff 20 some years ago is coming true today. Yeah, but that's because we're more interested in, in making money through things like non tangibles like NFTs and bitcoins and, and, and other things that have no substance to them. But boy, boy, we make money on it that way. We're very innovative. Yeah, well, you know, and the NFTs are kind of fascinating. There's, I read a little article today about from this expert in this world. He says, you oh, NFT is nothing more than a digital receipt. Yeah. He said, so it, it by itself is not worth anything. You know, if I got, a, if I got an NFT for, for the, the script to Hunger Games, that's worth a lot. But if I've got an NFT to, um, to the possession of a book that nobody's ever read, I ain't worth anything. And so um, you think in terms of the, the funder, we've, we chase technology and now don't think about the, what does it really mean? So how do you relate what's happening with Facebook and Meta? Um, and, uh, you know, their turn, or this is a pivot, or a bridge over troubled waters, maybe, <laughs> to uh, change people's minds uh, and have them focus on something totally different that's not, that nobody understands anyway? Well, um, the whole issue of, of the metaverse is kind of fascinating when you look in terms of the, the size of the gaming industry, uh, which is basically a meta universe, except you know it's the kids that have been playing soldier and blowing things up, but that's a metaverse. Um, and so on the one hand, this could be something pretty cool. On the other hand, I could be sar sarcastic and cynical and simply say, well, uh, Zuckerberg just needed something to distract people from all the problems that they're in right now. Um, but it's, you know, just like the, the whole issue of digital currency and crypto, it's not going to go away. It, it's going to form itself into something else. Well, we don't know what that is yet. Which gets me to the point of pay attention to the clues. Uh, because some smart dude is going to figure this thing out and make a gazillion dollars. While some prior successful company is going to sit back and just get their lunch eaten. Sounds like Polaroid. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> or, well, yeah. Bill, Bill's favorite analogy is Sears, but I'm not going to get him talking Sorry, about Sears. that one. <laughs> I've heard him talk about that they, one. <laughs> they were the Amazon of their day. Exactly, exactly. But, uh, so in practicality terms, we're talking about, you know, organizational leaders rather than government leaders, um, whether it's profit or nonprofit situations. Um, would you recommend, I mean, I, I believe one of the Marine Corps philosophies is to adapt and improvise, but within a system. Is that kind of the thing that you're telling people to do as corporate leaders or is, uh, is it different with your, the way you look at it? Well, I, yeah, I don't want to overplay the, um, the, the military side of the scene, because that, that's kind of a little bit of a different sphere as far as what you're trying to get done. But yes, um, or I'll, I'll go to, um, um, oh, this is a 10-year-old piece of strategy, <clears throat> maybe more than that now, 
that I was McDonald's had at one point in time when they were trying to really regrow after they had stumbled. And they kept using the term freedom within a framework. And the framework basically said, here's the guardrails. Don't go outside of those. Mm-hmm. But within of it, you got to figure out what to do. And so when you think in terms of that piece of freedom within a framework, you know, you, you look at the responsibility of anybody in a leadership position, and, I, and I'm going to break it down to they only have to do four things. They have to sense what's going on. In other words, look around the edge of the radar screen. They have to make sense of what's going on, which basically says you got to sit back and think. You got to decide on a course of action, and then you have to act on it. Well, the sense and the make sense are thinking pieces, the decide and act are the leadership, real leadership pieces. And the tough part is, so what are you going to do? You know, the, what are the decisions that you meet, need to make today to get ready for tomorrow? Um, and some organizations have done that brilliantly, and some organizations are stumbling because, to your point earlier, they're trying to get, you know, we can't spend money because otherwise we'll miss our target for this quarter, which is a pity. And they're, they're dealing with today in your terminology, but they're yeah. very few are preparing for the future. Yeah. They um, understand that. Uh, I had another question there and I just lost it. Ed, go ahead. I'll, yeah, I'll get my okay. question so, back uh, in a minute. So um, be the oracle, Bill. <laughs> looking down uh, and you get the screaming guy, let's call it a guy, a manager who's looking out uh, in this office space full of empty chairs and, and he, he doesn't know what to do. <laughs> How do you manage? Uh, well, um, this is one of those things. So, 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 he, wow. I'm going to give you two, ver- two blend two stories, um, because what I think what we're seeing in the great resignation right now, which is one aspect of you've got empty chairs. The other part is everybody wants to work at home. Um, you've got to figure out new ways to manage at a distance. And, and that's that's difficult for an awful lot of people. Now, one of the issues I think I will. This is an opinion as opposed to I don't have data on this one, but it's an opinion. I think a number of the organizations that are trying, they're hurting right now because people are leaving because they weren't good managers to begin with. Um, and so back to my, my stories of, you know, my, my career, I told you, I, I enlisted in the Marine Corps. I spent a year and a half as an enlisted man, got, got to go through OCS, went to, went to, got commissioned. And my dad, who was an old World War II sergeant, comes to my commissioning. And I'm expecting the old Sarge to give me a snappy salute because, you know, I outrank him at this point. And instead, he treats me like he's my dad. And he, and he starts poking his finger into my chest and he says, your only job is to take care of your troops and they'll take care of you. That got me through Vietnam. That got me through my career so far. And so when you think in terms of my dad's advice, we got all the way through eighth grade. Um, take care of your troops. Well, we didn't do that in too many organizations. You know, we were running the numbers. We didn't treat people like people. We treated them like a resource. I hate that term, human resources. It's like, oh, come on. Um, so what did they do? I think there's a whole bunch of, man- back to your question, Ed, I think there's a whole bunch of managers that have got to rethink how they're going to deal with people. And part of it is reflecting and saying, well, how did we screw up in the beginning um, and try to make amends if you can, but you got to re- we got to rethink the system. It's not, it's not a question of, it, part of it is a question of pay. And part of it is a question of how people are, have been treated over the years. Oh, so rather than just throw, throw stuff against the wall and see what sticks, um, like changing the name killing the name HR and just calling it people, right? Or yeah. something. If you don't have any backbone to that with solid examples, then it's worse than before, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I think it, it would be. If all you, you, can't, you can't put lipstick on a pig, all right? It's just, <laughs> it's just not going to work. Steven. Yeah, so 
I, th I would suggest to you that right now, the, one of the biggest leadership skills that leaders need to grasp to learn is how to deal with uncertainty and ambiguity. Would you, you would, so you're nodding, yeah, you would agree that. So I know you often say that we can't predict the future, but we can anticipate the future. Can you link those two thought processes together about anticipating the future, but also understanding that the future is going to be full of uncertainty and ambiguity? Yeah. If, um, if you agree, if you agree. No, no, I do. I do agree. Cause that's, that's part of this whole issue of, of um, we're going to live the rest of our lives in the future. I mean, the past has been kind of, it's a book, but, but the future is where we're, we're going. It's, it's a, we can't go turn around and re, redo the past. Um, I think that part of this issue, and back to my metaphor of the radar screen, is as you're starting to anticipate or, or adapt to, um, you're going to make some guesses. And when you go back to the, I mean, every decision that you make is a bet on the future. So as you're making decisions today, you got to kind of think in terms of how is this going to play out as we mo move into the future. What I've been suggesting to people recently is spend, I just did this this morning with my, the group I was working with. So I want you to spend a little bit of time thinking about three years hence. And we don't have to do 20 year time frames, three years out. Um, number one, what's, what's, What's probably going to look like? Number two, what could it plausibly look like? And number three, what could it possibly look like? And so the plausible, uh, the probable is simply simply saying, well, you know, knowing what I know now, here's how it's going to play out. Pl plausible, I get the three Ps mixed up all the time. Plausible basically says, well, what if? You know, what if something goes off a little bit awry? And then the possible is what if something goes back differently? Now, the reason I want people to do this is to kind of paint the picture of their future is because then they'll start seeing the clues that are there. Here's, here's, the, here's the metaphor or the story I tell you behind this. So, um, Ed, I, I, you know, just looking at you, you probably um, recently have been in the market for a you know, a brand new BMW 7 Series, and you'd really like to have it purple. All right, that's my guess for you. And as soon as you put a BMW 7 Series purple into your brain, as you're going around the city, wherever you are on the West Coast, you're going to see purple BMW 7 Series. <laughs> yeah, right. They've been there all the time, but you just didn't see them. That's right. Yeah. And so I think as people got to think about the future, and back to the point that Stephen was making, I think you have to make a guess to begin with about the future, and then you'll see the clues. But if you just simply say, well, I'll just wait for the clues to show up, you ain't gonna ever see them. Yeah, exactly. So, I will, I'd add to that also that historically, we have evaluated managers on their ability to deliver against a plan, you know, an annual plan. That's yeah. just deliver. I think going forward, we're going to have to evaluate managers on their planning process, their ability to design plans B, C, D, and E, or in your words, plausible, possible, and whatever. Uh, it's going to be a different way of, of how we look at people because right now, you know, as you say, the, the old folks, us old folks have been around for a while. And, and what we've learned is to take a plan and manage against it, you know, meet the objectives, no matter what, don't let anything get in the way. And, uh, you know, I believe it was uh, Dwight Eisenhower who once said that uh, it's not the plan that matters, but the planning. Yes. I, th I think that's becoming so true in today's world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's kind of fascinating. We're back to the, you know, the point that you made before it's, it's, uh, we just don't know what it's gonna look like. I mean, it's, it's gonna, it's, we're walking into an ambiguous world, but so what? You know, and we've been down this road before though. So my, my mother is long, is long gone, but oh my God, 20 some years ago, I remember having a conversation with her complaining about, oh mom, you know, the world is going crazy and you can't figure out what's going on. And she got this faraway look in her face. And she said, you know, she said, I went through the First World War. And by the way, she was an immigrant. She went through the First World War in Europe. Um, and she said, I went through the 
um, through the depression. And we went through the second world war. And then she just looked at me, she said, you know, Billy, we'll make it. <laughs> and so her, but her point was, yeah, it's, it's sure, sure it's gonna, it's been ambiguous, but it's been that way before. And what you need is people who are just gonna be, basically suck it up and go through it. Um, but I think we could probably be a little bit smarter than some of the people have in the past. So th this point that we, we made, all of us made a little earlier here about can't see the forest through the trees. You know, there, there's clues all around us, but we're just not seeing them. Yeah. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, I mean, in reality, uh, like uh, what was out there, out there uh, three years ago, not say 25 months ago, not 20 months ago, when we didn't know what COVID was, you know, and everybody's rocking it along, getting on planes, going here, going there, business is thriving, stock market is booming, everybody can't stand the president, but they just go out and spend money and, and everything was just great. And then all of a sudden, bang. <laughs> so somebody saw that coming, but mm -hmm. Maybe they didn't. I don't, I don't even know how to get my arms around that idea, but it was probably there. Well, I, I think, you know, if we, you went back to the commentary about the past epidemics that we've seen, MERS and Zika and all the rest of those, a good smart person would turn around and say, geez, how's this gonna play out? And, uh, you know, let's take it out, make it smaller. Um, we're old enough to where we, you know, does does the name Bernie Madoff make any make any sense to you? Yeah. Okay. There were a whole bunch of smart people that just got snowed by Bernie Madoff. There was a fellow that basically said this doesn't make sense, and he was a wolf. He was a lone wolf crying in the wilderness for a couple of years, and people said you're crazy, you don't know anything. But he was right, and a couple of people made a lot of money off of Bernie. Uh, because they shorted everything that was going on. There was also, when you think in terms of the, the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, you know, all the big firms, Lehman Brothers that went under and all the others were just kind of rocking and rolling and saying, gee, isn't this wonderful? There were a few smart people that shorted that industry and made billions of dollars. So the, the question is, um, yeah, we're gonna be, we're gonna be surprised but we shouldn't be taken by surprise. And that, that takes you back to a military issue of like, you know, and, and back to the, I guess it's not politically correct to, to admire a Confederate general, but Robert E. Lee was a pretty good general. And at one point in time, he admitted, he says, I get taken, I get surprised, but I don't get taken by surprise because I think about what could happen. And I think that's part of the challenge that all of us have in business is not, you know, not simply say, let's go down the, the shiny brick road, kind of turn around and say, well, what could happen? Hi, this is Ed, and I thank you for tuning in to Global TV Talk Show, a uh, unit on globalbusinessnews.net. Uh, we uh, broadcast to the world, as you know by now. So I wanted to make sure that you understand that our Programs are advertising supported. We're grateful for co-sponsors, advertisers. Um, they have a marketing budget coupled with a strong desire to be associated with our top quality program. And of course, I'm grateful. Thank you. So for the next few minutes, you're gonna see some uh, commercials. It's uh, mostly very low key and uh, our prices are very, very reasonable. Uh, our exposure for the advertisers go 12 months and beyond. Some of our advertisers have been with us since March, April uh, of 2020. And Google Analytics has tracked uh, over 125,000 what they call audience page views, which means you looking at this page, that's a page view. Now, if you happen to go to 
one of our other shows or to our radio broadcasts or to our newspaper or magazine, those become additional page views as measured by Google Analytics. And so when they say 125,000 since uh, spring of 2020 up through uh, Labor Day a month ago, that's pretty good numbers. And uh, the past 30 days, Google Analytics has measured uh, just under 6,000 audience page views. Uh, and that, according to them, is a 42% increase in audience participation over the month uh, of August. So thank you very much. Well, here's our advertisers, and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes or so, and we'll proceed with this interesting conversation. Thank you. This episode from the Meeting Room of Global TV Talk Show is brought to you by The Bridge School, the accredited international online private school of choice at bridgek12.org. Porch Light Rental and Destination Services. Reduce your renter lump sum or managed relocation costs. Visit them at porchlightrental.com. And by airs.com. With our full range of services, we can help design, and manage your international relocation. Find us at airs.com. Primestone Partners, featuring corporate, government, and developer housing solutions, as well as senior level advisory services. Find them at primestonepartners.com. And by International Auto Source. We are the vehicle experts for expats, featuring all major brands of automobiles with flexible solutions and financing. On the web at intlauto.com. Become a global player in your field. Cross Culture To Go provides virtual support for your global business and career success. We can help you thrive in 140 plus countries and markets. On the web at crossculturetogo.com. Something that's really neat is that the Bridge School partners with various organizations to provide learning for their students. For example, we partner with a major ballet company and we are able to enroll several of their students into our school. So now not only is the student able to participate in a school and have a seamless transition while they're very active in their ballet career, but now they have um, other dancers that are with them that are doing some of the same courses. So it's almost becoming a, a camaraderie where they're taking similar courses, they're working together on their ballet, and really being able to form this great partnership with these organizations to provide a needed service. A lot of times um, there are student athletes who will spend hours and hours at the gym or um, at the, the basketball courts, wherever it is. And if they're attending a traditional school, they're in school from eight to three. They get a quick snack and then they're at the gym for three to four hours in the evening. Coming to us and having that partnership, they're able to break that up throughout the day. They can have a morning practice, get some schooling in, have an afternoon practice, finish their schooling in the evening. So there's that flexibility. And additionally, if there are tournaments or performances, it's fantastic because if there's a week where they have shows straight through, they can take that week off of learning and then pick back up when they're done. So it offers this great flexibility. And for the program owners, of these sports leagues, it is a win-win situation for them because they see this need. They see this need that their students need to make sure that they are obtaining the grades necessary to be successful adults in, in our country and in other countries. But it provides them an environment where they can be successful at both. Hi. I'm Sergei Gorbatov. I'm Angela Lane. Together we are researchers, writers and practitioners in the field of human resources. And we've also been multi-country, multi-assignment career experts. 
We owe our professional development and growth to a very large extent to the international assignment opportunities that we have had. But in a world where distributed work may become the norm, we also want to understand what will happen to the nature, duration and purpose of international assignments. Together with our colleague, Julian Dalzell from the University of South Carolina, we're undertaking a study on the future of expatriation. And we value your contribution. You can participate in this important study by completing a simple 10-minute questionnaire. Access the questionnaire by typing in your browser tinyurl.com forward slash expert study. That's tinyurl.com forward slash expert study. You can also find the link here on Ed's website next to this video. Thank you for joining us in this study. In return for your contribution, we'll provide you with a copy of our research. And of course, you'll be invited to an exclusive webinar hosted by Ed, where we will share our findings right here on Global Business News. And so please go to tinyurl.com forward slash expat study. Take the survey so that we can better understand the future of expatriation. So, so let's talk about what we are um, smart enough to know is going to happen, but doesn't seem like anyone's doing anything about it. Um, here in Southern California, uh, earthquakes uh, and the electrical grid's going to go down. Yeah. Phones aren't going to work. Yeah. Uh, our cell phones won't, but landlines will. But who's got a landline anymore? Right? So, uh, and uh, you can't get around. So that means fuel, water, uh, and that kind of an impact is absolutely going to cause martial law to try to take over how things work, you know, yeah. and everyone's going to say, oh, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Yeah. Because there's nothing else to do, right? Mm -hmm. What is going to happen? And yet we know that's going to happen, but we don't know when or how big. So let's play with the earthquake thing for a second. Um, and here's, I just wrote about this two weeks, or two Ooh. days ago, or three days ago. Um, uh, and the story is the story of, of Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, the architect, who in 1919 got the uh, commission to design and build the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. And Wright basically said, well, Tokyo, they get earthquakes. I better build a hotel that's got seismic si uh, deals with seismic issues. Um, and the, the wiring or the piping that's going to go into the hotel, instead of making right angles on the piping, should be all curved because it less likely to snap. Um, he got challenged at one point in time to um, they were the budget was getting too large and they said, we've got to take out this pool. And then Wright said, no, if you do that, I quit. And they said, why? He says, because he said, you're going to have an earthquake here someday. There's going to be a firestorm because all of the, the water mains have been broken. You will need the water from that pool to put out the fires in the hotel. Now the hotel itself was brick and stone, but all of the window frames were wood. And he knew that was going to, going to be the weak spot for the hotel. The day the hotel opened in 1923 was the big earthquake that leveled Tokyo. <laughs> His hotel was standing. Oh my God. Yeah. And he got a, a telegram. He was back in the, in the United States, but he got a telegram from the guy that was in charge of this whole thing basically says, you know, your hotel is standing and it's being used as a spot for people to go to because it's one of the few structures that's still upright. So um, now, are we gonna? We, what are we gonna do? Have entire Southern California get ready for this thing? Well, wouldn't that be nice if? But we're not going to spend that money. But on a personal basis, you'd have to say, turn around and say, you know, do I have uh, extra batteries for my equipment? Can I can I have a charger for my cell phone? Do I, you know, I don't want to turn out into a survivalist, but, you know, am I going to put a little water maybe in the basement, you know, some jugs of water or something? Because um, 
to your point, Ed, I think if you know an earthquake is inevitable. It's we just don't know when. But if things are inevitable, that doesn't mean we just ignore them. We have we've got to do something on a contingency basis that says, well, what if? So the, the next problem. issue is water rising. So when Hurricane Sandy came <laughs> up the East Coast, yeah, um, Wall Street got flooded. Yep. And some and many of those old buildings, the high rises, they, they got uh, they, they couldn't work the elevator. They couldn't work anything because it, right. you know, it all shut down. And that's when Jersey City got built up across the, the, the water. Um, and so now they're back in building up all these buildings. And uh, so when that happens, that's going to happen again. The floods are going to happen, not only in New York, but. I'd say Miami and, uh, uh, you know, maybe Baltimore Harbor, but. Well, uh, Miami's uh, going to be underwater. Underwater, yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know, not a, I'm not sure about in our lifetime, but boy, there's people that are going to be having lots of, you know. Alligators, right? <laughs> <laughs> we got something going on there. I, I think the, the point though is um, you can't just ignore the future because it's, it's, we can't put a timetable on it. You it's know, if it's inevitable, it's inevitable. You got to deal with it. Oh, so, 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 so Stephen, how, how are managers going to get better working at all this stuff? <laughs> well, you know, um, I, I'll tell you, um, at one point in, in my career, I spent time working for a company that did simulations. And, and it was wonderful to put people through nasty simulations um, and they basically said, I used to facilitate a, a simulation just on project leadership skills. And in the sim, we had all kinds of things go bad. And I think one of the things you do is you put people through simulated disasters uh, and get them to think about it. The, the military does it, um, FEMA does it, not as well as they should, but we can do that. And we could do that on a personal basis. You know, think in terms of what what if I, you lose your job? What if something happens to you? Do you have savings? Do you have, simulate the disaster and see how you respond to it? I think in, uh, the answer partially, Ed, is I think you know, entrepreneurs will do this before organizational leaders will do it. And the reason I say that is, you know, organizational leaders, they're not in it for the long term. It's not their, it's not their company. They're, they're focused on quarterly, yearly profits. Uh, how many of them think they'll be there in five years? I mean, the, what the tenure of a CEO today is, what, three and a half years, something like yeah. that? Yeah. So, you know, it's, you know, go back to the what's in it for me. If you're the CEO of an organization, what's in it for me? I, why would I think about 15 years out, 20 years out? Uh, I'll, I'll be taking my stock options and cashing them in by then. So, but entrepreneurs, because it's their business, I think you'll you'll start to see it at that level before you'll see it in organizations. Bill? Oh, yeah. I think so. I mean, that's a sad commentary, but I, I just, I, I think that's the world we live in right now is uh, we're so short-term focused. Uh, and I would, you know, I'd, if, we had a, if we had another hour, I, I would argue with Bill's mother, quite frankly, because I would I would take the position that Bill's mother, when she lived through all that, she lived in a time when there were some people stood, people rose to become great leaders. You know, the yes. Churchills of the world, the Franklin Roosevelt's of the world, the uh, Woodrow Wilson's, uh, everyone around World War I. Where are the great leaders today? Um, and, you know, one of my, my soapbox has, has heard me say this before is, I don't think since the Kennedy administration in the United States that we had the best and brightest go into government. So that's not political. So, that, you know, since the Kennedy administration in the 60s, we've had Democrats and Republicans as presidents. And, you know, there have been a few, some, a few people. I mean, Reagan had some good people around him. Um, but in honesty, can you say that Obama's cabinet, Trump's cabinet, um, Jimmy Carter's cabinet, were they of the same caliber as, you know, what, Dwight Eisenhower had when he was president, what uh, Kennedy had when he was president, and this and brightest aren't going to government. So I'd like to, I'm going to argue with your mother, Bill, all, all due respect to her. <laughs> okay, good. Um, and she, she always loved a good argument anyway, so that would be good. 
Well, she raised you, she must have. <laughs> so, um, should I turn a light on? I'm watching, I'm going into the shadows here. Does well, anybody... I could see the sun is setting in your, your office there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I um, I'm blind. Okay. There you go. So you may want to shut that blind, but or, or we'll just end the program. But um, so what about why isn't maybe they are and they're not talking about it. Biden, for instance, um, asking Elon Musk and that guy, Peter Diamandis, uh, Elon Musk, uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, these guys have come up with these great plans uh, and executed them to make a deal and take over these big things that need to get done rather than have a politician run it. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, okay, there's no I'll, answer. Anyway. I'll jump over. And, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump over into the systems thinking world for a second. There's a truism in the systems thinking world that says put a good person in a bad system and they fail. Um, I think part of the problem that we have in the United States is our political system has become dysfunctional. Um, I've got a, a, a friend who is, um, he's a Harvard educated economist who's got social problems and he lives in the YMCA and he does menial work, but he's, the, he's brilliant simply because anyway, he's brilliant. And uh, I, I picked him up a while back to take him out to dinner. And, um, and I, you know, we were just driving along and I, I commented on the Washington. I just left it at Washington. And I said, so what do you think? What do you think? What do you, give me your, your summary of Washington at this point. And he was just quiet. And then finally, uh, the name is Paul. Paul piped up and he said, you know, the dumbing down of discourse. And he basically says, they don't talk to each other anymore. They just yell at each other. So I think um, you know, the part of the challenge there, whether Biden tried to bring people in or not, I think some of the people don't want to get into that mess because mm -hmm. they can see it's, it's a, you're not going to, you're not going to win. It's, it's a, you're going to get eaten alive if you go there. And also there, part of the other issue is I don't think he's going to get enough people to agree with him to do it because it, it doesn't fit the party line, whether it's left, right, or whatever, uh, you know? So I, I, my issue on Washington is the dumbing down the discourse of keeping some of the best people out of there. So if I may, Steve, just for a second, um, to bring my idea up of a water pipeline. So uh, the pipeline business, right? Okay. These guys know what to do. Oh yeah. Why hasn't they, why haven't they, they built a pipeline from New Orleans or even the Great Lakes to come to Las Vegas and California and just fill up the reservoirs with all this water? Um, I, I'm, I think we've had the same conversation. Um, I know. <laughs> You and I are on the same lines with that one because we got we got oil pipelines that are sitting empty at this point in time. Yeah, we could move water pretty easily. Um, uh, the answer is I don't know. Maybe it just makes too much sense, and and people don't see. I don't know when, when it gets bad enough, and it will get bad because right now they're they're actually rationing water for Arizona. Uh, this is the first time in history uh, coming off of the Colorado River. Um, it, it, somewhere along the line, somebody's going to all of a sudden come up like, whoa, I look at the idea that I had. And when, when I sh I'll tell them that, that Ed had it way ahead of him. So, <laughs> you need to uh, uh, sell your pipeline idea to some Bitcoin people, Ed. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I'm trying to sell memberships to my TV show. <laughs> <TV. right? laughs> Talk about pie in the sky. <laughs> so, Bill, are you optimistic, neutral, or pessimistic about the short-term and long-term future? Well, can I be realistic? No. Define realistic. What is realistic? It's it's a little bit of, of uh, I guess it's this blend of 
yes and no optimism as far as you know where the world is going. I, you know, like I said from my mother, we've been down this road before. We'll get through this thing. On the other hand, it's going to get pretty bad along the way. Um, you know, I, I wrote a back to my probable, plausible, possible futures. Um, I wrote something, um, you know, I think I put it out on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago about, you know, sat with a cup of coffee and I came up with a, a, a number of scenarios for these three things. My, my political scenario was probable is that we're going to have more and more extremes on the left and right, and we'll be yelling at each other. Plausible is that we could actually get a third party that's sitting in the middle, but possible is we could get civil war um, because we got enough guns in this country to where people are going to say, well, you know, you don't like my way of doing it. I'm, let's just take things over. So, and that's, that's part of me is the pessimist on that one on the possible that's sitting out there. But I, I think we've been, I think from, from a business perspective, I think we're, we're smart enough to get through this thing. From a political perspective, it's going to get uglier um, before it gets better. We're not, we're not at the bottom of the pit yet, I don't think. But, I, you know, I'm just one guy who reads the newspaper once in a while. <laughs> yeah, so, right. Um, some states may want to form their own country and just, uh, you know. Yeah, that was, that was an Oregon thing. Uh, it wasn't the state. It was, it was people in, in Eastern Oregon who've got, I mean, their gun toting God almighty, uh, never mind. They're just different. And, and, and they're, and they're angry. And, you know, to some degree, you know, I, I think one of the issues that we've got in this world right now is we don't spend enough time saying, I wonder why they feel that way. Mm. We, just oh, put, yeah. we just put a stamp on them that says they're, you know, they agree with me, so they're right, or they disagree with me, so they're wrong. Yeah. But we don't spend enough time wondering. Um, and I think that's, a, that's another missing skill. So it's, it's, it's not something that we should say that the Russians are doing it. Uh, it's like they're trying to infiltrate. I mean, it's like an old movie, a James Bond movie or something um, from the past, from the Iron Curtain, you know, and visiting Helsinki or visiting <laughs> Vienna and finding secrets and uh, of just movement to disorient the public enough to cause a problem for something else to happen. It's like an old movie. Yeah, except it's, we're, we're living it in real time because of social media. Um, and it, it, you know, ideas and rumors and, and theories just fly at the speed of a, of a keystroke. And it's, wow, it's, um, it's tough. It's all real, real time or artificial time, because so much of that is uh, not, you know, it's, it's false information. So are we living in reality or are we living in artificial time? Oh, man. Some of us are hoping we're living in reality, and some of us, <laughs> don't care if we're living a reality. I'll have to leave it with that. I don't know. What it's me. I, want, I want to get you back. I don't know. I'm on one, one of Ed's programs, maybe not our leadership program, but I, you know, <laughs> you're, you're learning from the past. I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, there's nothing to say America should remain the most economic, powerful nation in the world. I mean, Great Britain did when, when did not, when they ruled most of the world. Uh, yeah. um, going Genghis Kong didn't when he had it. Alexander the Great didn't when he had it. Um, you know, so um, <clears throat> why, why should we make any assumptions that the United States will continue to be the most powerful economic engine in the world? Um, is that probable, possible, or, um, or what? I'm not going to put it in the probable area. I'm going to put it in the plausible. That plausible. Way, yeah. Number one. Um, but I, you know, probable, um, I, I agree with the rise of the East. Um, I think in the next 20 years, we're going to be watching them get ahead of us. Yeah. I, I did work in China um, a number of a few years for a while. And um you know, I had a friend of mine that at that time, his thing was, oh, all the Chinese could do is to copy. They just copy us, blah, blah, blah. They graduate, you know, like seven times as many engineers as we do. Yeah. And they're aggressive 
and they're, um, I, I don't mean aggressive in the, in a nasty sense. I think they just want to succeed an awful lot of them, not getting out of politics. And making smart. things work. Uh, but and they're smart. Work. And right. you know, yeah. you, you put that common combination together, you got a big talent pool, you got people that want to get ahead. Um, they're going to be with us soon. And I don't know if and when they'll surpass us, but they, they'll be with us. So as we come to a near close on this, a soft close, um, I read that, uh, remember that old TV show? I think we're sort of contemporaries. Uh, remember the old Walton TV yeah. show? Yeah. The, fam the family and there's all the uh, nice homilies and good feelings, right? Yeah. So they're bringing the show back. <laughs> and, and, and the guy who's going to be in charge now is John Boy who's now grown up, right? And so he's like our age. And so, uh, and so they're finding, they're casting these kids and you know, people to sort of replicate, uh, not exactly the old with a touch of the new. Uh, and so I was reading some of the, uh, the PR about all that from uh, Variety. I subscribe to Variety watch what's going on there anyway i found that to be really fascinating because i love that show religiously and that's like uh, a rural present day america with some faith involved uh, but it's more or less family and multi-generational stuff going on mm -hmm. and i haven't read any of the scripts yet but it seems like that that's where they're going is to who knows if they're going to make it work, but uh, it's, or if anybody's going to care. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. So, but I, th I think that kind of cultural thing, cultural icon thing is possible, whereby like all in the family hit a nerve, if you recall that 20 years ago. Um, it just struck a nerve on cultural divide and made people laugh about it. Yeah. Uh, but it's still there. And so the Waltons and their old Americana, things will work out if you help people who you love make things work, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't know. We wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, take me out of this, Stephen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well... Bill, what? thank you. Bill, you've helped <laughs> us achieve our number one objective for this, these programs, and that's to have a interesting, robust dialogue. And I, I think we've achieved that here today between the three of us. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. Nice to meet you. Okay. Take care. Uh, thank you, Steve. All, all, all the best. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Thank you. To you Ciao. too. Bye bye. Bye now. Thank you for joining us in the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show. Have a wonderful day, and stay safe.